This is Duke University. Good morning. I would like to begin by thanking Dean uh, Aravamudon for his warm words uh, of introduction and the Muslim Publics Initiative here at Duke, and in particular, Ellen McLarney, for the kind invitation to, to speak in a topical and emerging field of study in which I'm far from competent, let alone a specialist, um, and of which I will speak this morning, I fear, only somewhat sideways. But um, in short, I would like to begin by saying that it is a real pleasure and uh, honor to be here with you today. The recent upsurge, indeed resurgence, of democratic, religious, and populist demands and movements throughout the Middle East, Tunisia, Egypt to begin with, but soon followed by Libya and Syria, with no end in sight, really, marks yet another historical, and I would also argue, more than simply historical instance of the unforeseeable eruption of novel forms, formats, and formulas of the political. By this, I mean as much the proliferation of concrete, practical forms of politics, no matter how tentative and provisional, indeed often illusory and deceptive, but also the abstract, the more abstract conceptual and systematic challenge to our metaphysical, that is traditional, and as some say, ontological understanding of the political. The political, if you like, as such, le politique, as the French say, as distinguished from la politique, practical politics. Maps, we can see, are being redrawn, and not just geographical or territorial or even institutional ones. It should not surprise us, but perhaps it quite often still does, that this happens in places where one would have least expected it, and this especially at times that seemed less than favorable, and in fact increasingly bleak as to the genuine prospects they seem to allow for any viable political, much less democratic, or call them popular and progressive alternatives to slowly or quickly emerge. As the French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy observed in a 2011 op-ed article in the French daily Libération, and I quote, the Arab peoples are signifying to us that resistance and revolt are with us again, and that history is moving beyond history with a capital H writ large. They are doing it as is appropriate with all the fortune and misfortune that it involves. At the very least, they have sent, though, an irreversible signal whose effects we can expect to see across Africa and in the odious perpetuation of the drama of Canaan's ancient land, end of quote. Speaking of the West's soul-searching and hand-wrenching responses and more often complete lack or inaptitude thereof, Jean-Luc Nancy claims that with regard to the question of allied military strikes, for example, from the air in Libya, but it seems one could easily extrapolate from this particular example, a simple truth has imposed itself, namely the painful insight that global responsibility of political representatives and commanders in chief, government officials and military planners, media pundits and the general publics, public school scholars included, quote, means weighing up and dealing with such circumstances, end of quote, and to do so at the risk of getting things wrong. 
somewhat provocatively and not unproblematically, Nancy puts it like this. I quote, it is fine for the beautiful souls of the left and the sophistic operators on the right to sigh or protest, whether in European or Arab countries. One must know which world we are in. We are no longer just simply in the world of Western arrogance, self-confidence, and imperialism. Oh, it's not that the old, that the poor old West has cleaned up its act. It is simply that in the process of melting in the fusion that begets another world, without sunrise or sunset, a world where it is day and night everywhere, at the same time, and where it is necessary to reinvent the act of living together, and before all else, the act of living itself. So yes, it is necessary to keep a close eye on all these strikes that are aimed at undermining the vile assassins of the people. Here the reference to Muammar Gaddafi. Sure, it is necessary to strike him, him, of course, not the people. We can no longer with one hand invoke the sovereignty that with the other hand we empty of substance and legitimacy through all the interconnections, the best and the worst of the globalized world. It is up to the people in question and to all others, including us, to ensure then that the oil, financial and arms dealing game that installed and maintained this puppet among many others in power does not start over. It is the responsibility of the peoples. Yes, it is also, of course, to us, the peoples of Europe and America, that this is addressed. It is a delicate task. But at stake is what we want to live and how we want to live it. C'est ce que nous voulons vivre et comment nous le voulons qui est en jeu. With an acuteness that we are not accustomed to. That is what the Arab peoples are also signifying to us, end of quote. In other words, the publicized, televised resistances and revolts, revolutions and reforms, even where they fail or experience what are perhaps inevitable setbacks, invite, no, require us to rethink in a post-Cold War, post-communist, and increasingly post-Western no one's world. What changing the world might yet again mean? This problem then is none other than the age-old question as to how or what we want to live. But it's also one whose imperative in its very existent extent, whose imperative in its very extent and urgency, scale and pace, has been greatly, indeed globally, increased and expanded. There is an at once wider and deeper sense of responsiveness and responsibility from which we find it more and more difficult to distance ourselves. Que signifie changer le monde? What does changing the world mean? Was also the title of a ser seminar conducted by the French philosopher Alain Badiou in 2010-2011 at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. Badiou, in an open letter to Nancy, responded vehemently to any semblance or any literal endorsement of possible Western-led interventions, regardless of context. But you, therefore, reach the irreversible signal and the possible effects of which Nancy had spoken altogether differently, as perhaps should we, permitting other than interventionist or non-interventionist that is to say, other than diplomatic and humanitarian, other than military, strategic, or tactical models, to enter into the equation as well. Indeed, but you read their sense, at time sensation, although these are not his terms, as that of a spark, an event, noting that, quote, starting from virtually nothing, resonating everywhere, the popular uprising creates unheard of possibilities for the whole world, end of quote. 
and adding that, quote, a change of world is real only when an inexistent of the world, the people in his view, start to exist with maximum intensity, end of quote. And further exemplifying this by saying that, quote, a square in Cairo acquires global fame in the space of a few days, end of quote. And concluding that, quote, the power of this phenomenon is such that a truly remarkable thing is such that a truly remarkable thing, the whole world concurs, end of quote. Indeed, Badiou goes on to muse, as one might well call this in Rousseauistic terms, he goes on to muse that this might well be, in the Rousseauistic terms, an expression of the general will, or more philosophically put, the emergence of a truth, which, when it does so, hardly presents or represents itself in the form of a, quote, numerical majority, but with authority, even with a dictatorial element, nonetheless. I quote, but you, authoritarian in the strict sense, because at the start, at any rate, the fact that there is an absolute justice in the historical riots is what no one is entitled publicly to ignore. And this precisely, and it is precisely this dictatorial element that enthuses everyone. Like the finally discovered theorem, proof of a theorem, like the dazzling work of art, or a finally declared amorous passion. All of them things whose absolute law cannot be defeated by any opinion." End of quote. This is a quote from uh, The Rebirth of History, uh, Le Reveil de l'Histoire. Not only these two aforementioned philosophers, but also social and political theorists, political leaders and commentators, have attempted to assess the now accelerating, then disturbing moments and momentums, the sense and sensation, in whose aftermath, perhaps in whose wake, we must all think and act, write and teach. Not the least interesting observation has been that even, or should we say, especially at the highest levels of government authority, President Obama and his team, leaders can be seen now as attempting permanently to read or as constantly having to read the signs of the times, the writing on the wall. Not accidentally uh, and not sarcastically or ironically, the editor-in-chief of the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, uh, al Ben, interestingly called Obama at the very moment at which these other pieces were published that I cited earlier, quote, a theoretician of the Arab revolutions of the masses, end of quote. We may not want to discuss that here now, but uh, it's interesting, the argument that he makes. Several, though not all among these theoreticians, though, have rightly asked whether or to what extent religion as an increasingly global and consistently media-driven and oriented, media-oriented phenomenon has not only directly or indirectly influenced, inspired, or curbed the political movements, and if you like, popular moods in question, but also the West's not only, but especially perhaps Europe's and the US's willingness and preparedness to react to them, and not always responsibly, as they occurred and manifested them themselves. Yet what makes these historical moments and momentums so difficult to anticipate and fathom is, as Nassim Taleb and Mark Blythe note in a special 2011 issue of Foreign Affairs devoted to the so-called New Arab Revolt, is the fact that they install a deep sense of unpredictability, more precisely, of the volatility, the ups and downs of life, 
in political, no less than economic processes and the novel events that both drive and upset. These revolts and revolutions and the events they make visible or possible are technically, quote, black swans, to adopt an idiom long used in the philosophy of science. That is to say, there are happenings that are not only rare, but the falsification of long-held theories and convictions. They violate common assumptions regarding certain patterns of expectation, undermine our trust in the proportionate relationship between causes and effects, and challenge the deeply ingrained conviction, if not always wisdom, that there can be nothing new under the sun, as the biblical author of the book of Ecclesiastes put it. Quote, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. As Taleb and Blight give a shot at explaining why recent things have happened as they did, or how anything in general can politically or to follow their model economically happen at all, they write the following, quote, what the world is witnessing in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya is simply what happens when constrained systems explode. Complex systems that have artificially suppressed volatility tend to become extremely fragile, while at the same time exhibiting no visible risks. In fact, they tend to be too calm and expand, expand and exhibit minimal vi vi variability as silent risks accumulate beneath the surface. Although the stated intention of political leaders and economic policy makers is always to stabilize the system by inhibiting fluctuations, the result tends to be precisely the opposite. These artificially constrained systems become prone to black swans. That is, they become extremely vulnerable to large-scale events that lie far from the statistical norm and were largely unpredictable to a given set of observers. Indeed, the longer it takes for the blow-up to occur, the worse the resulting harm in both economic and political systems. To make systems robust, all risks must be visible and out in the open. Fluctat nec mergitur. It fluctuates but does not sink goes the Latin saying. So just as robust economical systems are, are ones that encourage early failures, the US government, Taleb and Blight conclude, should stop supporting dictatorial regimes for the sake of pseudo-stability and instead allow political noise to rise to the surface. Making an economy robust in the face of business swings requires risk allowing to be visible. And the same is true in politics, end of quote. And yet this should not make us forget that the so-called New Arab Revolt, to stick with this somewhat problematic designation, like any revolt, revolution, or even reform, has, of course, unique and distinct characteristics, putative causes, and uncaused effects in different countries and separate regions. As Liza Anderson, president of the American Academy in Cairo, cautions in a lead article opening this issue of, this special issue of foreign affairs that I referred to earlier, and entitled, Demystifying the Arab Spring, parsing the differences between Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, a more historical and comparative view of social, economic, political, and cultural trends of things and events in their context should make us pause against sweeping judgments and unwarranted generalizations. On her reading, then, there is no one black swan that besets, or for that matter, epitomizes all empirical situations in exactly the same way, much less at the same time. Volatility, like chance, it seems, is itself a necessarily volatile notion. Systems crack if and when they do, 
for a variety of structural as well as contingent reasons. And these form no common pattern, nor do they make a common cause, as we tend to think or like to believe. And yet one might take the different analyses that Taleb, Blight, and Anderson put forward, perhaps yet one step further, suggesting that what factors, if one can say so, into these movements as one of the elements contributing to a particular result, albeit without ever becoming registered by established models of explanation and prediction that both historians and social science scientists tend to rely on, are such unlikely phenomena as theological or theological political wonders, genuine philosophical events, and special mediatic effects. And what these phenomena, I would argue, share is that they have a proper logic and, as it were, mind of their own, even though their logic or thoughts, their very idea, are not easily describable in rigorous, consistent, or coherent theoretical terms. And yet this admission should not make us forget that what I would like to call their deep pragmatic relevance obeys more speculative and intuitive patterns and practices of thinking and acting, including experiencing and sensing, some of which might be compared with spiritual exercises and spiritual experiments at the micro, meso, and macro political scale. This, nothing else, is the impact global religion is currently having. This, nothing else, is what solicits, indeed calls, for the total recall of its virtual, that is to say archival, if more than merely historical past. Of course, this much is certain. If any generic structure or any guiding, perhaps universal idea can be discerned in the upheavals, in the reveil or rebirth of history, in the precise sense that Alain Badiou gives to these terms, the idea of the generic and the idea of idea to begin with, then these must also, as he puts it, traverse and transcend the particularities or so-called situations from which they must begin by distinguishing themselves principally and categorically, conceptually and consistently, ethically and faithfully, not to say militantly. I first came across Taleb's work in reading Sari Nusaibes tenor lectures at Harvard. And Sari Nusaibes name and work was first mentioned to me in Cairo, where many years ago I attended a conference on global civil society and violence. As a scholar of medieval Islam, and the president of the Al-Quds University in East Jerusalem, his work, in fascinating ways, blended an advocacy of nonviolent resistances with a no less remarkable insistence on the possibility of creating, or rather, of authoring events, indeed, nothing short of miracles. In the aforementioned tenor lectures, albeit somewhat in passing, Nusaybe invoked Taleb's famous bestseller, The Black Swan, in which Taleb, a former venture capitalist, who as a child witnessed the outbreak of the 1973 war in Lebanon, coins a black swan, again, the famous metaphor used in early 20th century debates in the philosophy of science concerning the limitations of inductive method and indicating the single falsifying fact or event whose very truth proves hypotheses and previous theories to be wrong, Taleb defines the black swan as, quote, that unpredictable occurrence which has the radical effect of wholly transforming our knowledge as well as our lives, whether in one fell swoop like major wars or financial crashes, 
or in stages, like computer technology, end of quote. A black swan is a phenomenon that in the case of significant historical events, mark the sudden collapse of seemingly well-entrenched patterns and regularities. Such events are seemingly sudden and totally at odd or out of place and can be unpredictable in the sense of inexplicable as of yet or indeterminable through and through, depending on whether one espouses a unitary or pluralistic view of history. Yet in either case, one might say that history does not progress or, for that matter, decline, at a walking pace, but rather, on the contrary, that it, quote, jumps. Whether we assume that it results from one course or from a complex interplay of mysterious forces as the prime mover, ultimately, a deep-seated, though undiscoverable, single undercurrent, or rather, from an inchoate set of diffuse possibilities, the, mid the difference matters little to produce an indisputable sense of history and its sudden jolts, which hold sway over human initiative and over human control, which is precisely, as Nusaybe illustrates, what Tolstoy's War and Peace sought to instill in its readers. And this even though a conscious act, faith, and courage are still to be looked for, as Nusaybe holds out as an alternative view, and as other authors such as Vasily Grossman in his book Life and Faith often considered War and Peace's 20th century successor adds to the equation as he speaks of small, seemingly mad acts of goodness in spite of the totalitarianisms left and right. Totalitarianisms which Vasily Grossman suggests begin in the very principle of all, quote, organization, indeed from the very moment that Christ speaks, as this, nothing else, is the beginning of church and empire, state and nation, fascism and Stalinism. Taleb's work, which interestingly but in, passes, in, in passing cites Al-Ghazal, Al-Ghazali, as an important source of inspiration, together with the Greek atomists, Isaiah Berlin and others, allows Nusaybe to raise two important questions. First, is an event, for example, the outbreak of a war, such as the one in Lebanon, the result of material causes or a divine plan whose workings are merely unknown and invisible to us, or is it, on the contrary, the arrival of the uncaused and unpredictable or improbable par excellence? And second, and more importantly, are there ways, and this is Nusaybe, to, quote, find that magic wand by which we ourselves can call a black swan into being, or by which we can make that creative leap with the help of what Joan Ritalik calls a poetical wager, a poetical slash ethical, poetical wager in the arch, arts as in human affairs more generally, thus breaking patterns, creating our own swerves, interrupting some natural or automatic process or routine, in short, or paraphrased, by authoring a miracle. This, Nusaybe continues, after all, by all accounts, especially now, is at least what the Israeli-Palestinian conflict now needs, a miracle, but of our making, end of quote. In other words, what is the near schizophrenic disease of the mind, the dual will or double vision that we must call and rely on to escape from the mass psychosis, this is all Nusaybe's terminology, that war, the very state of imminence, is and remains. How do we substitute predetermination of any kind by an act of sheer 
determination of will. And further, how do we assure the constant reenactment this requires, since only this will break through the mechanistic and deadlocked situation in which we are trapped as the victims of our own folly? Interestingly, it is at this point then that Nusaiba invokes a, quote, secular faith, a belief in miracles, but of our own making. But what does that mean? How do miracle workers make their appearance, produce their effect, and this all too often in the 11th hour, as the gospel narrates? And more importantly, what do these leaps of folly with their near indistinguishable sense and sensation presuppose, metaphysically and ontologically, theologically or existentially, but also politically, perhaps even aesthetically speaking. And finally, what shape could peace even take if and where it emerges? That is to say, is made rather than merely breaks out on its own initiative, as it were, that of a miracle, an authored event, a special effect or black swan, in which we have a decisive hand, Nusaiba suggests. But again, what would that mean? After all, how can these be possible given the no less indisputable fact that especially under modern contemporary and global conditions, miracles have come to signify once again all those wondrous occurrences that are precisely not of our making, but instead require divine intervention or at the very least, divine assistance, call it grace, nothing less and nothing more. It is with no further human authorship or miracle working required, much less desired. Nusaibe's tenor lectures circle around a secular faith that is, first of all, simply the, quote, faith in our capabil capabilities as political agents, end of quote. And the fact that the lectures tie this faith to the event of and believe in miracles is hardly fortuitous, given Nusaibe's overall theme, which is the need for resolutely philosophical reflections on the Israeli-Palestinian war, the title of his lectures, in a situation of near total and permanent imminence, in which no changes, in which no chances for change present themselves spontaneously, much less necessarily, all by themselves. And if we could say that they lie somehow, somewhere in waiting for us, it is nonetheless, Nusaiba leaves no doubt, we who are the ones they are waiting for, to reuse a phrase well known by now. Indeed, in Nusaiba's very readable highly recommended autobiography, Once Upon a Country, A Palestinian Life, he courageously claims, once again, and I cited this before, by all accounts, especially now, this is what the Israeli-Palestinian conflict needs, a miracle, but of our own making. This book, Once Upon a Country, also cites Hannah Arendt with reference to the human condition and what Nusaiba calls her admired definition of political action, namely as, quote, leaving one's private hiding and showing who one is by disclosing and exposing oneself. Publicly and responsibly, politically active, that is. The passage marked the necessary distinction and transition between contemplation and action whose latter necessity Nusaibe admits only reluctantly. After all, he notes Riley, quote, who enjoys exposing himself, end of quote. And yet he adds to this that one ought, perhaps, must do so. And when and where one's, when and where one's conscience, as it were, forces one into a corner, leaving no choice, but to engage the world as it presently presents itself in its most repulsive of forms. 
taking these to the logical, no less than existential extreme then, it is almost as if the world in its present state and stasis of imminence and perpetual war leaves us nowhere but leaves us nowhere and leaves us nothing but to turn to faith worldly or secular and hence not necessarily religious, theological or mystical to turn to. Indeed, Nusaibes cites Arendt. It may well be a command of, quote, political realism to turn or return to the archive of those infinite improbabilities or improbable events called miracles about which religion knows one thing or two. Nusaibes' more sober account in his recent book, What is a Palestinian State Worth?, adds an important dimension to this appeal. This appeal to and faith in secular humanist values whose countercurrent traverses history, that is imminence and war, mass psychosis and impasse, phenomena we know and resent. For here, his constructivist, deeply pragmatic perspective, according to which we author the very miracles we may well need to survive, is further supplemented with an ever so slight emphasis on and reliance on a weak humanistic force to parody Benjamin. In any case, to an other power, albeit not the power of some, say, transcendent religious or even ethical other. Almost surreptitiously and subterraneously, the strife for power can quasi miraculously, rather than organically or dialectically, revert into the power of empathy and of love inspired or triggered, as these are, by the phenomena such as compassion and, quote, the human face. And let me read this quote. Of course, Nusaibab writes, again, in what is a Palestinian state worth, of course, one cannot deny the impact of the hunger for power and the use of force and violence and its instrument throughout human history. However, the fact that this hunger has been a salient feature of our history does not make it into an eternal law. I believe, Louis Eibach goes on, that the gradually increasing it, indeed one can even argue that values and norms of human making, though initially informed by self-serving hunger for power, slowly have become and are becoming more informed by compassion and the human face almost in the way the cave art of our early ancestors eventually bloomed as that of old masters, end of quote. Needless to say, this view, indeed this other reliance, sits uneasily side by side of Nusaibes' overall assessment. Namely, and I quote again, that a Palestinian state if it were miraculously and inexplicably to appear, would really be a prime example of what black swans are, or of erratically jolting atoms, of those infinitely improbable occurrences that Hannah Arendt would count as miracles, as no evidence points to their eventual creation, to its eventual creation, and indeed all available date dates indicate its evaporation from the realm of possibility. I conclude. Can faith, as Nusaibes seems to suggest in this meditation, be secular? Can miracles be made or authored? And what might miracles still or once again mean when they do not necessarily deny or undo the objective naturalistically interpreted, even if not fully determined, predestined, imminent order of things per se, but merely allow or invite us to view and review, perceive and treat these empirical and reasonable facts in an altogether different light. Call it that of a total social fact 
or fact of reason, perhaps. And this with the most unexpected of outcomes. Finally, is this a matter of trying and seeing or simply being just attentive to the sense where we are currently at? Nusaibe's answer seems clear, and I quote, what the future holds remains, of course, an open question. But its openness has less to do with our, know with our not knowing what will happen than with our knowing or not quite thinking through what we really want to happen and therefore not working to bring it about, end of quote. Must we have faith first then and see, think, and judge and act second? In other words, what makes us sense the logical or virtual, improbable or impossible possibility of miracles? And what allows us to differentiate them from the sensations that in an age of global media are out there and for a good reason as well? How do we distinguish the icons from the idols true or genuine, mystic or political speech from its idolatrous, or as we used to say, ideological offshoots, which are clearly, let's add this, much more than a mere distortion, perversion alone, but a noise that comes with the phenomenon as such, whether we like it or not. And further, what makes us, if not perform, then at least recognize miracles and their quite special effects for what they really are, namely the very element and form that human agency, or more broadly, all events, political and perhaps other, must take today so as to bring novelty into a world that by its own account, indeed by the account of all accepted conceptions and our rationality, of our rational accountability, seems to have no longer much space and place for them. Now that the particular predicament of, of the political impasse in the Middle East does not stand on its own, and that it is that it's unlikely, yet undeniable, miraculous breakthroughs may hold lessons for our understanding of history and agency more generally in geographically and geopolitically different conflict zones in the Western and non-Western world and with reference to altogether different religious and philosophical antecedents, present context, and future outcomes. This is something that Nusaiba would seem to allow. In spite of his emphasis on the specialness of the place and name of Jerusalem, and all the bitterness and hope it, or at least the very name, symbol, and reference still represents, his Nusaiba's deep pragmatist and constructivist account, like Padius, I think, has a universalist, perhaps universalist prescriptive bent. And yet no explicit reference is made to the wider horizon of what must be the implication, the logical and political, even existential consequence of his overall argument, formulated as it is in the Tenor Lectures, in his autobiography, Once Upon a Country, and a host of articles and media interventions. And yet by invoking the alternative ways in which, Arendt, in which Arendt conceived of miracles, Nusaiba seems to acknowledge that miracles and miracle belief are eminently transportable and translatable into other decidedly modern contexts that have supposedly moved beyond age-old superstitions, the entrenched dogmatic understandings of faith, and that at least verbally adhere to a radically disenchanted world and nature with an imminent frame of reference in which fundamentally deterministic mechanical laws of cause and effect, de jure and de facto, hold sway over all phenomena, whether physical or social, cultural or psychological. And at first glance, the realm of political freedom and human agency would seem to form no exception to this most stringent of rules that governs the so-called order of reasons and the way we see and approach and intervene in reality. Yet, in this wider intellectual and political, mundane and cosmological context, the contrast between a generalized perception of reality in terms of disaster 
and a no less well distributed, indeed omnipresent possibility of generic and generative miracles. That is to say, between the permanence and imminence of war on the one hand, and the unpredictable, even improbable emergence of a black swan, of say peace or the worst on the other, forms yet an historical foil against which genuine events, in conjunction with true human agency, call it sense and sensation, may make themselves noticed, felt, and of consequence. Thank you. question, but it's actually going to be a characterization or, or, or what I, the way I'd like to think of what your talk is trying to do, and I want you to respond as to whether right. this is accurate. I sort of feel, well, I think there are basically three broad ways in which one could see the relationship of the miracle with the theology. Yes. And I think what your talk today is doing what I would call the third approach what the previously be two approaches that have been broadly significant. I mean, the first one, of course, is the famous one of the Schmittian approach yes. to say that the miracle, uh, I mean, that the state of exception in uh, politics is equivalent to the miracle yes. of political theology, yes. which makes a certain kind of way in which the miracle is really, to some degree, at least appropriated to a right-wing construction of authority outside the law. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, there's another way, which uh, the second way, in which I see at least a broadly, um, you know, Levinasian Derridian tradition of uh, detranscendentalization. That's both aware of the ex extreme sort of versions of mediatization, not completely dismissing it, but, right. but trying to bring it down to uh, the secular without always managing to fully do that because of the way. In less right. that easy to be transcendentalized. Right. Now, what I see this talk doing is something quite different. Mm -hmm. It seems to mm -hmm. be linking to uh, Baju and Asari Nusaibe in this very interesting way, but I see it as potentially a kind of maybe even retranscendentalization or re-enchantment, but from below mm -hmm. in a way that mm -hmm. is, is, is doing, I would if it succeeds, something quite opposite to the Schmittian reading of the first kind, yes. which is that it's it's trying to take the black swan or the yes. miracle as this way back into possibilities that seem not to exist in the disenchanted world yes. of the you know second kind, which is nonetheless a refusal of the yes. second world of the first kind. Yes. Now, is, am I? Am I? Uh, is yes. This, I, this is very schematic in the way that I've understood it, but. That's what I see the possibility of your talk. Yes. No, thank you very much. This, this is excellent. I'm, I, I cannot speak to the whole question. Uh, and, uh, but let me say this. Um, what I think my um, um, interest in the problematic of religion and media, um, where I'm very much an observer and someone who learns from, from others than, than having any original thoughts, but what, what it inspires in me is uh, indeed the need to move beyond some elements of the tradition of political theology. Um, and in the case of Schmidt, for example, um, when he speaks of um, theological categories having become secularized into political or juridical ones, there are two possible ways of, 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 of um, understanding that claim. The one would be like, say, a genealogical claim or an historical claim. Uh, so first, these concepts and motifs were theological, and now they have, you know, petered out, or they have become mundane, imminent to the world at, of politics. Um, and that's a genealogical or, you know, evolutionary claim, an historical or dialectical claim, whatever you want to call it, that I think is deeply problematic. Uh, the uh, more modest interpretation would be to. Uh, emphasize, let's say, a certain Weberian legacy, even in, in, in Schmidt, 
where you merely insist on the analogy, where you say, well, you know, there's a structural uh, analogy or, uh, which allows us to see that certain theological notions have found their functional equivalent uh, in political terms. And uh, you're right to point out that somehow I would like to uh, avoid at least do these two claims, never mind now for the moment Derrida and Levinas, where I think you know, my deepest deaths are. There's no doubt about that. But um, by saying that, well, you know, um, instead of arguing that the, 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 the religious world has become secular, right? Um, take it in the version that Charles Taylor develops in, uh, in uh, a secular age with his insistence on the imminent frame, etc. Uh, I would like to say, well, you know, not, not, not so fast. Um, there is a sense in which precisely uh, the world of imminence, of uh, mass psychosis, which are fair descriptions of you know, the present day world, uh, and could be you know, analyzed at infinitum in uh, naturalistic, historicist, and you know, mechanical terms almost, right? Uh, nonetheless allows, even if it were true in its bleak picture of things, could nonetheless coexist with uh, a belief in, in, in miracles. Whether religious or secular, that then becomes the question, right? Um, because uh, everything ultimately hinges on the question of perception of our, our sense of our making out um, um, what phenomena are, phenomena are in truth. And that's where, you know, to make a long story short, there are two lines of argument that I find very promising that I did not de see developed always in, in full detail in, in either Levinas or Derrida, but that I think one can develop with the help of a more Wittgensteinian tradition, the work of Stanley Cavell, uh, but also, very interestingly, but I was not going to be so foolish and to speak about that in this audience, with the help of medieval Islamic theology. And in a longer version of the paper, uh, as, a, as a pure dilettante, I, I, I follow the steps that uh, Nusaybe makes in his reading of Avicenna uh, and, and, and his uh, teasing out a, a subjective notion of freedom, and especially of Al-Ghazali, where he basically says that it is Ghazali's occasionalism and his use of Greek atomism that allows us to think or believe or you know, rely on a uh, possibility of God or divine freedom to reconfigure the elements of what is. And in my more mundane way of appropriating that, I said this is very, this is very similar to what Stanley Cavell says when he speaks about criteria for knowledge and understanding uh, and says, well, ultimately, you know, when we identify a phenomenon, ultimately criteria, epistemic criteria, will leave us uh, you know, uh, dissatisfied. Ultimately, what a thing is called is what I am willing and able to call it. Right? So what a thing is, even in matters of epistemic objectivity, right? uh, you know, for the most diehard of sciences, ultimately it's my call. Right? And with the Wittgensteinian register, one could say, well, the phenomena, all the senses and sensations out there in global media that we study, um, you know, as scholars and as and that we read uh, and see as, as citizens, we're dealing with phenomena that always present itself in an at least um, in the possibility of at least two interpretations, which is like the duck and the rabbit. You know, so you see a phenomenon, and uh, there's no way you could epistemically or with the help of any other criteria make out what it is. Is this a possibility for real change or is it more of the same? And I think I take Nusaiba uh, to, to argue in the Tenor Lectures and throughout in his writings and often with beautiful biographical uh, detail that there's no way we're going to get out of imminence, out of war, out of you know, the mass psychosis if we're not willing to risk this kind of uh, near schizophrenic dual vision, uh, if we're not willing and able to be of two wills, right? Not to deny the world as it is, but you know, in spite of that world, nonetheless will and see something else. So you know, if something happens, a revolt or riot or you know, spring or revive, is it happening or is it not happening? You know? No amount of historical you know, uh, uh, scholarship, uh, not even retroactively, 
no amount of you know empirical research is going to tell you uh, which one it is, you know. Um, and that is the, the subjective, if that's the name for it, a stance that I find uh, very, very promising. Yes, please. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I have two related questions. One is why, if I understood you correctly, you're suggesting that the establishment of Palestinian Authority is not really a legitimate basis for the Palestinian Authority. And the second is that the establishment of Palestinian Yes. Yes. Well, to begin with the second question, this is the part where, at least in Nusaybe's work, and that's where you know I'm much more indebted to uh, to the tradition of phenomenology, uh, uh, Levinas, Derrida, and, and, and others. But um, in um, in interesting ways, um, Nusaybe operates there as a uh, uh, someone interested in uh, contemporary cognitive psychology on the one hand, and in what he calls existentialism, which he takes from 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 Hannah Arendt. So it's it's a fairly so at least, uh, but uh, but I feel that he basically um, uses those categories. Uh, a fairly down-to-earth conception of human values and of psychology and of human existence and of freedom, whenever he speaks in a modern philosophical register, whenever you know in the longer version of the of the paper that I'm happy to send to you if you're interested, uh, it, it is clear that things are much more theologically and mystically uh, in, inflected when he actually does the readings of Avicenna, of uh, of Al Ghazali and, and 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 many others. Um, um, as to the first question, I think the argument he's making that uh, you know, no amount of um, diplomacy, uh, uh, roadmaps, uh, an endless you know, back and forth, no however sincere and patient undoing of all past you know, injustices is going to uh, untie the knot, right? is going to... Uh, um, solve the situation and bring about something else. Uh, even leaving open as a question, which you, you rightly pointed out, and which I think he addresses quite centrally in this last book, What is a Palestinian State Worth? Whether you know, a new nation state right, uh, with severe restrictions is, is something that you know, should be one's uh, ambition in the first place. But um, I think what he... He uses the metaphor in the autobiography of, of the existential swap, right? So there is an imbrigation of uh, uh, occupiers and, 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 and victims, right? Uh, or of those who hold others imprisoned and those who are prisoners. And that's the impasse. That's the, that's the, 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 the predicament. And there, there seems to be no way out. And one could analyze en endlessly psychologically why, why this, this, is, this is so. And you know, if you look. Not at, let's say, the, the current American television series Homeland, but at its, uh, its, 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 uh, its prequel, its, uh, its, uh, the Israeli version that is available also now in, in its first two seasons, uh, also in English, uh, with, with subtitles, uh, Prisoners of War, War. You see that you know, what, what keeps that uh, show going and uh, quite spectacular, interesting to, to read, you know, with all problematic aspects as well, is precisely this profound sense, not of, you know, current American political paranoia, but uh, the sense of imbrication, of, uh, you know, uh, the switching of sides and uh, in, in terms of also uh, effective um, um, senses of, of loyalties and of who one is, and, and etc. You know, I cannot really summarize it, but that would be my, my hunch. And I think that Nusaiba basically says that you know, there's no way out of that unless one is you know, willing to uh, wage that uh, po poetical and ethical uh, leap of faith, right? for which the tradition of miracles gives us prime examples, but which we also you know, should not just wait for, but also do and make on our own account, right? author or engender ourselves.
There's a very interesting language of engenderment there as, as well. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.